Hello, I'm James Johnson. Thank you for joining me for this exploration of the music of the French composer Maurice Ravel in the context of his own time and place. That context was France in the years just before and after 1900. I'll be playing and speaking about a set of piano pieces called Miroir, Mirrors, from 1905. Maurice Ravel was born in 1875. He died in 1937. Ravel was born 13 years after the best known French composer of the time, that's Claude Debussy. And Ravel worked to create his own distinctive musical voice. It's also fair to say that both Debussy and Ravel worked to create a distinctive French voice, given the continuing strong influence of the German composer Richard Wagner. That task was sharpened after the French defeat in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and the loss of large amounts of French territory to the Germans. The nationalism that both precipitated the war and grew from the war only increased in the years leading to the First World War. Therefore, in a large sense, it's fair to say that both, that Ravel's musical voice was both personal and national. The fin de siècle, the end of the century in France, embodied dramatic contrasts that we may recognize today. Some called it the Belle Epoque, the beautiful era. We think about the engineering miracle of the Eiffel Tower. We think perhaps about cabarets and cafes on terraces. The first motion pictures to appear were now screening in the Latin Quarter. The first department stores to appear were now being built in Paris. We might think about photos we've seen of men in tuxedos riding bicycles down the Champs-Élysées, the Belle Époque. And yet, there was also a pervasive feeling of unease among many, unease about the extravagant displays of wealth that became more and more prominent, unease that old world values were somehow being cheapened by consumerism. Some even voiced fears about the decline of civilization itself. Others claimed that scientific research would end by destroying the human soul. And others decried the pervasive Americanization of France. For many, this was a realization that progress comes at a cost. This was also a period of discovery and particularly discovery in the new field of psychology. There were experiments of hypnosis at one of the major Paris hospitals, and soon the experiments in hypnosis were open to the public for people from the general public to watch this emergence of something new. Scientists called this the unconscious. Scientists therefore began the study of the human psyche it was the widespread object of experiment and study, and it was also a cause of widespread anxiety. For some, the project was to unmask the hidden urges of the human psyche, and what they discovered included violence and lust and primal instinct, and others found such discoveries extraordinarily fertile, particularly artists. This was a new realm into new subjects for painting, fiction, poetry, and music. This inner world of dreams and desires, as well as delusions and even madness, this inner world was made public in a new way. Ravel had close friendships with poets, intellectuals, and artists. His music is an expression of his time. And so I want to explore these worlds and how they bear on his music. I'll touch on his subjects of music, what subjects he chose for his music. I'd like to talk about his views of art and his views of the artist. And I'd also like to ask about our own experience of listening. We have just heard Pavane pour une enfant défunte, which is most commonly translated as Pavane for a dead princess. What about this title? Well, a pavane is a grave 
and courtly dance written in a slow duple time. We hear that in the pavan that uh, I have just played. It was popular in the 17th and early 18th centuries in England and Italy and in Spain. Who was an infanta? An infanta is the daughter of the ruling monarch of Spain or Portugal. She is the eldest daughter who is not in line for succession. It's her older sister who will become queen. What is the experience of an infanta? How does she move through the world? She's honored, but she lives in a shadow. She's elevated at ceremonial times, but is she neglected at other times? Is she lonely? And what's the mood at the time of the death of an infanta? I imagine the mood as wistful, resigned perhaps. I don't imagine it as tragic and majestic. And I think I can hear this wistful resignation in the music. Well, such is our impulse when we see a title. We conjure an image, we see a scene, perhaps we create a story. But a comment from Ravel might make us want to question this impulse. Ravel reports that he composed the music before naming it. And in fact, he describes getting together with a friend and deciding what the title should be after he had composed the music. They judged the title by one criterion alone, the sound of the words. And they eventually came up with the title Pavane pour un enfant défunt. I'd like to quote Ravel's description of this process. Ravel wrote, in choosing the words that would make up the title, I dreamed only of the pleasure that alliteration would bring. And so I, in translating this title, uh, have come up with a less typical translation to try to capture this alliteration, Pavan for a fallen infanta. Now I continue Ravel's quote. He wrote, this work is not the funereal grief of an infanta who has just died. It is the evocation of a Pavan that such a princess would have danced in the court of Spain. So in other words, the title and the music are not entirely unrelated, but their relationship is at a slant. This is an insight into Ravel's view of composing. Ravel was not a romantic, which is to say his view of music was not the expression of his own struggles and joys and passions and dreams. The romantic view of art is still popular today. We sometimes think that the artist's motivation is pure self-expression. Well, this in fact is an inheritance of the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. We think about romantic artists, we think about Beethoven, we might think about the painter Delacroix, we might think about the poet Walt Whitman. In their view, artists pour out their suffering and their struggle, their triumph, their passions in the music, in the painting, in the poetry that they create. Beethoven, for example, believed that there was something eternal and infinite in the human spirit that art both articulated and developed. For Beethoven, music was an entry to a world of higher understanding. It embraced humans, but humans could not quite contain and grasp music itself. Music for Beethoven was a means of transcendence. It was a glimpse of another world, and it touched the thing that all humans share, this ineffable, eternal, infinite part of our spirit, and connected it with something higher. In this romantic view, therefore, every product of true art is partly independent of the artist. Some artists believed, some artists believe that art partakes of something divine and perhaps gives a glimpse to humans of divinity. This was not the view of Ravel and his contemporaries who had a very, very different view of art and of music and of how attentive listeners respond. I would like to explore these views of art and our experience of it with the five piano pieces that constitute the collection called Mirrors. This collection came just six years after the Pavan 
the pieces have a wholly different sound and effect. These pieces also bear titles that are specific and concrete. These uh, titles include references to moths and to birds and to bells and boats. I'd like to begin with the first two of this set, Night Moths and Sorrowful Birds. I said that the titles indicate concrete subjects. This set of pieces has, I think it's fair to say, differing degrees of concreteness. Night Moths, which opens the set, is the least concrete. Night Moths has much whirring and buzzing and flying. There are fragments of melodies that emerge and then they recede into this very busy texture. In the middle section of this short piece, the music seems to coalesce into more sustained phrases, yet they're still hazy and indistinct and abstract. This middle section, the sustained phrases eventually dissolve and the flying and the buzzing and the fluttering returns and then takes over. There's a similar abstractness in Sorrowful Birds. Ravel creates a different atmosphere from the night moths, but it's still blurred and atmospheric. For me, it's a sound that's evocative of dusk. And yet, I think also there's more clarity in Sorrowful Birds than there is in Night Moths. Here, I think it's easy to imagine birds and perhaps even sorrowful birds. Noctuel, Night Moths, and Oiseau Triste, Sorrowful Birds.
Ravel wrote about the relationship between music and our own lived experience. The context was a description of his own approach in composing music. In this description, he makes a distinction between what he calls artistic sincerity and conscience. Artistic sincerity was his word for originality. That is to say, it was the capacity of an artist to create something new. Artistic conscience was his word for integrity. That is for resisting doing what has already been done. Especially, it is resisting mere self-expression. Conscience therefore led him to see composition as serving a deliberate and often particular goal. And that goal was usually decided in advance. Let me read a little bit from <clears throat> this essay of Ravel's to illustrate the point. He wrote, I refuse simply and absolutely to confound the conscience of an artist, which is one thing, with his sincerity, which is another. This conscience compels us to turn ourselves into good craftsmen. My objective, therefore, is technical perfection. He also wrote, sincerity is of no value unless one's conscience helps to make it apparent. What is expressed, therefore, from these descriptions is not the composer's feeling, which in Ravel's terms would be sincerity without conscience, but rather originality and integrity. And this, in Ravel's terms, is done by being able to cre create a desired effect. Again, this is a quote from Ravel. He writes, art is a beautiful lie. The most interesting thing in art is to try to overcome difficulties. Ravel claimed that his inspiration for composing came from an essay by Edgar Allan Poe. This essay is called The Philosophy of Composition. Poe wrote it in 1846, and it's an essay about writing the poem, The Raven. Reading it will make anyone think twice about romantic notions of artistic creativity. This essay describes the composition of writing the raven step by step. Poe says that it was done, quote, with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem. Poe begins by observing that most people think poets write in what he called a frenzy of pure inspiration. He says this is wrong. Rather, Poe says, everything is plotted. And so in writing the poem, Poe reflects, he began with the question, what kind of poem do I wish to create? And the answer, he says, was he wanted the poem to be about 100 lines long, and he wanted its effect to be melancholy. He writes that one way of creating melancholy is through repetition. In the poem he was wishing to write, therefore, the repetition would be a single word, it would be a word that would be, in his words, sonorous and susceptible of protracted emphasis. Poe said he decided that the long vowel O would have that effect. So then he sets about wondering what sort of word with a long O would be sonorous and susceptible of protracted emphasis. And the word is nevermore. Now, here's a puzzle for Poe. What would be the plausible reason for the word nevermore to be repeated again and again? Moreover, who will utter that word nevermore? Well, Poe quickly rules out a person. He says it would seem strange for someone to keep repeating nevermore, nevermore. And so he comes up with a solution, a parrot. No, but then he decides the parrot is not a good choice. The imagined, the imagined voice of a parrot saying, never more, never more, never more, he says, would be silly after several repetitions. It would certainly not stir melancholy. Gave it more thought, and he decided, yes, it has to be a raven. He begins this poem with the line, quoth the raven, never more. And then he works out the action that justifies the line, quoth the raven, never more. We know that action. There's the death of a maiden. There's a tormented lover who will never see the maiden again. There's the raven that haunts the writing studio, the small dwelling. 
of the tormented lover. The line, quoth the raven, nevermore, ends five of the poem's 18 stanzas. The word nevermore ends an additional six stanzas. The, word, the words nothing more end another six stanzas. And the word evermore ends one stanza. What does this teach us about Ravel? Ravel referred to this essay again and again. His conclusion was start with the effect. And this came to be his personal style. Ravel strongly denied that this was the music of Impressionism. We think about the art of Impressionism. We think about the stance of the artist as though the artist is a passive observer and merely records what the artist sees, the light on the buildings, the light on haystacks, the time of day, the weather, the passive recorder of what happens outside of the observer. This is not Ravel's view. Ravel's music is not impressionist, and in stating this, he's drawing an explicit distinction with the music of Debussy. Ravel also, thinking about desired effects, Ravel also thought about what it would write, what it would be to write a uniquely French musical style. I mentioned the First World War before. Just after the First World War, Ravel set about writing a group of pieces, piano pieces, that paid tribute to those who were fallen in the war and also somehow captured the French musical tradition. He did this in a way and in a voice that's deliberately conservative. It's utterly different from the music of the mirrors. It includes even a section that's based on a French dance style from the 17th century. This was his means of beginning with the effect and then thinking about the ways to produce that effect, the tribute to France and its traditions, the tribute to those who had died for France. This was calculated and it was resistant to all notions of self-expression. What do we think about this? Is it disingenuous? Is it manipulation? Do we fault this for being somehow inauthentic? Well, for Ravel, what kept his music from being these things was conscience, which is to say, pushing forward the boundaries of art. And yet also we acknowledge that his musical compositions provoke deeply subjective feelings and responses in listeners. Ravel knew about this, certainly. He knew about the inner landscape of the soul. He followed the experiments in human psychology in the last decades of the century. And he kept close company with poets called symbolists, poets like Paul Verlaine and Maurice Maeterlinck. He'd, he kept company with poets and he knew the works of the symbolists. The symbolists explored the effect of the sound of words on our psyche, quite apart from their explicit meanings. We think again about giving the title to the pavan, pavan for a fallen infanta. The sound of the words have a particular effect and we know that he's aware of that effect on the psyche of listeners. And also, surely, he nudged listeners toward certain moods with his music. The pavan, we remember, is not the mood of mourners, but it is the evocation of a pavan that such a princess would have danced a piece of music about a piece of music that creates a certain mood at a slant with the meaning of the words of the title. So what then is the relationship of this artist to his art? What is the relationship of the titles he gives to the music he writes? These are some of the questions I think about in listening to the pieces in this set, Mirrors. And I think of them especially these questions in the next two works in the set, A Boat on the Ocean and Al Borado del Grazioso, both of which to me are visually evocative. In A Boat on the Ocean, for example, I hear, I see the shimmer of light on the water. I hear, I feel, I imagine the swell and the power 
of the ocean, the towering waves that gather forces and then crash on the rocks. I imagine the spray on the rocks. In the next piece, Al Borado del Gracioso, it's usually translated from the Spanish as the jester's morning song. I hear something earthier, coarser, more raucous than a court jester. In fact, in my imagination, I see a man who has spent the night carousing, and he's now alone in the empty streets. And when the piece opens, he's giddy, and there's a little bit of glimmer of light on the horizon. He makes his way happling, he makes his way happily, somewhere between dancing and stumbling through this sleeping city. And then comes the middle of the piece. He's suddenly fallen asleep, and his dream is magical, menacing. And he suddenly wakes up, and he stirs, and there's the glorious sunshine. And then I remember Ravel's points about the fallen infanta, that we shouldn't judge the piece of music by its title. And then maybe I should take it all back. This is Un Barque sur l'Océan, A Boat on the Ocean, and Alborado del Grazioso, The Reveler's Morning Song.
relation of music to lived experience. That is the lived experience of the composer and also the lived experience of us as we listen. I'd like to end with a word about the title of this collection, Miroir Mirrors. And that is some thoughts about a mirror. First of all, a mirror is of course not reality, but the reflection of reality. Its relation to reality it might be compared to the distance between a piece of music and the title of that piece of music. A mirror reminds us that some artifice is involved, but it also shows us a close version of lived experience. A mirror grounds the image in reality, but of course it's not reality. Ravel himself commented on the word. He wrote, the word mirror should not lead one to assume that I wish to affirm a subjectivist theory of art. He goes on, a sentence by Shakespeare helped me to formulate a completely opposite position. The eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. That's from Julius Caesar, Act One, Scene Two. I hope these observations and this music have brought you some insight into the music of Maurice Ravel, perhaps some insight into art more generally. Thank you for spending the time. I end with the last piece in the set of pieces called Mirrors, La Vallée des Cloches, The Valley of Bells. <laughs>